All right, jumping right into things immediately, I have to ask, where the heck are we? What is this house that Sonic is sleeping in? Is this Sonic's house? It kind of seems like that's what they're going for here, but Sonic doesn't live in a house as far as we know. He does have a house mentioned in the story of Sonic Labyrinth, but I don't know if we should pay any attention to that. This is very confusing here. I have no idea what we're supposed to be looking at. Maybe this is Tails' house and Sonic is just crashing here. I suppose that's possible, I guess, maybe. I'm just gonna chalk this up to another classic case of Sonic Team just needing the story to start like this and not really caring about what this implies about Sonic and his living status and stuff. So, uh, moving on. Sonic, after waking up from a nap, grabs this mysterious ring here, who out of it pops Shara, the genie of the ring, and she explains that, uh, the legendary Blue Hedgehog is needed to save the world of the Arabian Nights, the fictional stories of, like, Aladdin and all that stuff. She shows Sonic that the pages of the book have started to turn blank and that the words are disappearing. And along with the words, the world itself contained inside the book is also starting to vanish. And this is all the doing of the Eraser Jinn, a powerful genie who wants to harvest the power of the Arabian Nights world and use that to break out into the real world. And Shara has contacted Sonic, as according to the legends of the Arabian Nights, only the Blue Hedgehog can defeat the Eraser Jinn. And Sonic's just like, yeah, okay, sure, I'll do it, why not? He's perfectly happy to go along with this whole scenario that he learned of just now. I mean, how can a world inside of a book even technically, like, exist? Because it's a fiction, it's a story, whatever, who cares? And how did Shara's ring end up on Sonic's desk? It doesn't matter, just whatever, go with it. Of course, there is one problem, which is that all of this is happening inside of a book. And how the heck is Sonic supposed to get in there? But Shara explains that she is, of course, the genie of the ring, and as such, she can grant the wishes of whoever is her master, whoever possesses the ring. And so she gives Sonic her ring, and he puts it on, and now he has signed the contract with Shara, he is now her master, and that means she can grant his wishes. And uh, as kind of a way to demonstrate that, Sonic starts sneezing, and so he wishes for some handkerchiefs to blow his nose. And he certainly gets that, he gets a lot more than he bargained for. And Shara's like, come on, Sonic, you need to be taking this seriously, this is like a real problem. And he's like, I know, I know, it's fine, we can do this, we got this. But Shara's a bit like, oh boy, I hope this works out okay. And so now Sonic wishes for Shara to take him into the world of the Arabian Nights, and she's like, as you wish, my master, and Sonic's like, stop with that master crap. I'm Sonic the Hedgehog. Makes perfect sense for Sonic's character that he doesn't think of himself as above or below anyone else, so he doesn't like titles like that. And so Shara's like, all right, Sonic, let's go. And they get on a flying carpet and travel into the book, into the world of the Arabian Nights. And before we go on, one thing I just want to talk about a little bit here is the whole premise of this game is so strange to me. Like, Sonic entering the book, the fictional story of the Arabian Nights and Aladdin and all that, it just seems so completely random. Like, what does that have anything to do with Sonic whatsoever? Like, where did they get the idea for this? What was the inspiration for we're gonna have Sonic jump into the world of the Arabian Nights? How do you go from we need a Sonic game on Wii to that idea? It just, it, it seems just so random and out of place to me. They're just like, let's just do this because why not? The only thing that makes any sort of logical sense to me, maybe, is that this is kind of playing on the original story concept for Sonic, where he kind of is a storybook character. And so, you know, he's jumping in and out from different storybooks, maybe, but I highly doubt they were still thinking of that concept by this time in the Sonic series. So I guess someone just recently saw Aladdin or something and was like, I want to do something like that. A bit random, but uh, I guess whatever, we can just go with it. Anyway, not long after entering the world of the Arabian Nights, Sonic and Shara run into the Eraser Jinn himself, who basically just goes on his bad guy spiel of, Err, I'm destroying the world of the Arabian Nights because I'm evil and blah 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 whatever. And once I collect the seven world rings, then I'll have the power to do whatever. And then Sonic is like, seven world rings? What's this guy talking about? 
And then the Jin has a very notable moment here where he's like, Hey, Shara, did you get me the Seven World Rings yet? And she's like, those don't even exist. I don't know what you're talking about. And even if they did, I wouldn't give them to you. Clearly, these two have a bit of history, and then the Jin looks at Shara in a certain way and is like, Oh, really? You're not gonna give me the Seven World Rings? And Shara kind of backs away uncomfortably. And then he comments about how she needs a befitting punishment. And then he shoots a little fireball at Shara, but Sonic gets in the way and takes the hit instead. Which the Jin basically explains that this is a little fire arrow that's like tied to the person's soul. And as the flame goes out, so too will that person's life. And so he says to Sonic, get me the seven world rings before the flame runs out or you're gonna fucking die. So, you know, now we've raised the stakes a little bit more. Instead of just having to get this done before the Eraser Jin can destroy the world of the Arabian Nights, Sonic's life is also on the line here now. Oh, and yeah, if you couldn't figure it out, the Eraser Jin's name is kind of stupid because it's a combination of Eraser and Razor. You know, Eraser, he's destroying the words on the pages of the Arabian Nights, and then his weapon is a big, weird, stupid razor blade, so Eraser Jin, it's fucking dumb. Oh, and uh, one last thing in this scene that's worth mentioning is that the Eraser Jin refers to Sonic as some blue rat, and Sonic is quite annoyed by that, because he's like, I'm not a rat, I'm a hedgehog. And that becomes a recurring thing between the two of him, constantly referring to Sonic as a rat or a sewer rat or whatever, and Sonic's like, I'm not a rat, goddammit. But, uh, you know, the Eraser Jin's a big douchebag asshole, so he doesn't give a fuck what Sonic says, he's just gonna call him whatever he wants. And, uh, it's a bit late, but it is worth talking about the way that the story of Sonic and the Secret Rings is presented in this kind of motion comic style. Obviously, this is done because this is clearly a bit more of a budget Sonic game, so they couldn't afford to have full 3D cutscenes for everything. But I actually think this works really well for the game, because, you know, with it being inside of a storybook, we kind of get a little bit of a storybook presentation to things, kind of. And also, I think that the art is really, really nice, and it does a decent job of keeping things engaging, so I really have no issues with the way the story is presented in this game. Now, from here, actually, I'm gonna start skimming through a big chunk of the story of Sonic and the Secret Rings, because to be honest, not a lot of it is very important to, like, the main story of what this game is actually about. The vast majority of the game is just kind of, like, adventure stuff of we gotta go here, we gotta find this person, we gotta beat this boss, we gotta collect the seven world rings. There's not a whole lot of, like, actual, like, plot progression or character development throughout most of the story, and there's not really too much of significance here. So I'm just going to kind of briefly touch on the main points and kind of just skip over to when things start getting important again. First thing I want to touch on is when Sonic runs into King Sharyar, the ruler of the world of the Arabian Nights, who, as it turns out, is Eggman. He's like, Eggman, I knew you were behind this whole thing. But then King Sharyar explains that, no, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm the king. And then Shara's like, whoa, Sonic. This isn't who you think this is. This is, in fact, the King of the Arabian Nights. And Sonic is uh, not exactly convinced by this, but he decides to go along with it. And then he eventually also runs into Tails, although this isn't actually Tails, this is Alibaba. Yeah, in the storybook Sonic games, they have it where prominent characters from the story that Sonic is inside of are represented with familiar Sonic characters. Which I think is a pretty fun idea, it's kind of like the Sonic characters are playing these characters as if it's like a play or a performance or something like that, and Sonic is the only person that's not in on it. It's a good way to include our familiar Sonic cast while at the same time not pointlessly shoving them into the game. It kind of works and is fairly natural in that way, because these aren't the Sonic characters, these are the characters of the story. It's just that Sonic, and by extension us, as we're looking through his eyes, we are seeing them as the Sonic characters. I think that's a fun idea. And uh, also, one other character that Sonic runs into is Sinbad, who is played by Knuckles. And not only are these Arabian Nights characters being played by our familiar Sonic characters, but they also do kind of take on their personalities, like Sonic and Sinbad butt heads with each other in a very similar way to Sonic and Knuckles, and so on and so forth. And before we move on again, another thing I want to talk about is how this game has a lot of similarities to many other Sonic games that were coming out around the same time. 
And I don't think that's supposed to be intentional. I don't think these things are connected at all. It's just uh, kind of the product of many different teams making Sonic games simultaneously to each other. Because, like, first of all, this game, the whole idea is Sonic is in the world of the Arabian Nights. But when you actually look at the level themes in the game, that doesn't really come across almost at all. Like, the first world, like, yeah, sure, that's some Arabian Nights right there. But then the next world is Dinosaur Land, and then the next world after that is, like, an ancient civilization with, like, steampunk technology. And then there's also, like, a world that's, like, a pirate ship graveyard, and it's like, these level themes are, like, exactly the same as the level themes from Sonic Rush Adventure. That game also had the dinosaur jungle, the ancient steampunk civilization, and the ghost ship graveyard. Why are these so similar, and what does this have to do with the Arabian Nights? Pretty much absolutely nothing, it's just, you know, we need a video game, so we need some fun environments. And it just so happens that two teams that were working at the same time ended up coming up with nearly the exact same ideas. I definitely don't think that these teams were coordinating with each other and intentionally making their games similar, I think it's just happenstance. And then, of course, along with that, all this Arabian Nights stuff of, you know, genies and magic lamps and flying carpets and stuff... All of this comes up in the Sonic Riders games with the Ancient Babylonians. In that game, it states that genies and magic lamps actually come from Ancient Babylonian technology, and that flying carpets were just early prototype extreme gear, and people thought that the Babylonians were genies just because they didn't understand their advanced technology. So, is that at all connected to this? Probably not, I would assume, so that means that the magic carpet here is a real magic carpet, I guess? And these genies have nothing to do with the genies of the Babylonians? Again, it's just a weird coincidence that different teams that were not communicating with each other, that were both making Sonic games at the same time, both kind of were doing similar ideas, but because they weren't communicating, we have this weird incongruent thing where genies in the Sonic world are two different things. I guess you can get away with it because in Secret Rings this all takes place inside a fictional storybook that I guess you could say was based on the ancient Babylonians? Maybe? I guess? But even then, like the stories of the Arabian Nights and Aladdin and all that, those are fictional stories, but in the Sonic universe, those fictional ideas, like flying carpets and genies, are real in a way due to the ancient Babylonians. So it's still pretty weird in that sense. And if you want even more weird coincidences and overlaps of similar ideas, this game also has an Ifrit, which appears in Sonic Rivals 2, a giant fire demon monster thing. And interestingly, when the Eraser Jin is summoning the Ifrit, then he also mentions Iblis in, like, his magical spell chant. Is this connected to Iblis from Sonic 06? Are all these things connected together? Uh, uh no, probably not. Ifrit and Iblis are both real things that exist in other mythologies, and I imagine that they were just taking the names and using that as inspiration for the things that they were coming up with in these Sonic games, and, you know, multiple games were coming up with fire monsters, so they both pulled from the same inspiration places for their names. So now in the Sonic universe, we have two Iblises and two Ifrits, which some of them are connected together with the Sonic and the Secret Rings versions, but those are not connected to the Iblis or Ifrit from 06 Arrivals, and those Iblis and Ifrit are not connected to each other, because all of these games were made by different teams that were just completely doing their own thing, and they had nothing to do with each other, and the Sonic series is a giant fucking mess. This is part of the reason why I advocate for the idea of not trying to fit every single Sonic thing into one giant master canon, because for one, that doesn't make any fucking sense in many cases, but for two, it's clear that all the different teams that were making these different Sonic games were trying to do their own thing, not paying attention to what the other teams were doing, and so, like, the Ifrit that exists here in Sonic and the Secret Rings was made completely unawares of the Ifrit that exists in Sonic Rivals 2. These are not intended to be connected, these are completely separate ideas that just so happen to be similar. These things are not all part of one larger Sonic universe, they are all their own little micro-series that exist inside the envelope that is Sonic. 
to try to connect them all together is like taking five different puzzles and trying to somehow construct them all where they form one larger picture, but in reality that just creates a jumbled mess. So personally, I prefer to look at those five separate pictures as five separate pictures like they really are. And I'm sure that whole spiel there just generated a bunch of comments of people saying, No, Sonic is better when it's just one thing. In Sonic Frontiers, they make references to all these different things at once, so they are all part of one new blah 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 blah. I know, I know, I know. In the current context of the Sonic series, they try to fit all these things together, but at the time when they were making these games, there was no intention to fit them together, and so that's how I like to look at them, with the same mentality that they were actually made with. Plus, as I said, when you try to fit them together and just say that it's all one universe, that just creates an endless series of contradictions and things that make no fucking sense. But anyway, moving on now, getting back to things that are actually important to the story of Sonic and the Secret Rings, while collecting one of the Seven World Rings, Shara and Sonic run into a giant monster thing that the Eraser Jin summons, and Sonic asks Shara if she might be able to dispel this creature with her magic, but uh, quite upset, Shara explains that the Eraser Jin is far stronger than her, and she is powerless against his magic. And then Sonic is like, okay, I'll just beat this thing, no problem, but Shara, you shouldn't be so sad, you should always keep on smiling. And he explains that this is not an order as her master, but a promise between him and her. And they even do the whole uh, pinky promise kind of thing. And while Sonic goes to fight the monster, Shara is left there thinking about the promise she just made and whether or not she's going to be able to keep it. Building towards something in the future? Eh, perhaps, perhaps, let's keep going. After beating the monster, they collect the first of the Seven World Rings, and Shara then explains the prophecy that mentions Sonic that uh, once the world is put into great turmoil, then the legendary blue hedgehog is going to arrive to fix everything, and that once the seven world rings are gathered, then the door connecting the worlds shall open. However, the person that collects these keys must be offered up in sacrifice in order to make it happen. Apparently, those words were recently added to the story of the Arabian Nights, and that is why Shara sought out Sonic, as she sees him as obviously the legendary blue hedgehog that's here to save everything. Of course, with the flame arrow in Sonic's chest, he's being forced to collect the seven world rings for the Razor Jin, which means that if things keep going as the Jin has planned, then Sonic is going to end up dying in order to allow the Jin to enter the real world. That's a bit of a problem, but at the same time, they kind of don't really have a choice, so Sonic and Shara have to continue on their adventure and just hope that they'll be able to defeat the Jin and stop all this from happening. Oh, by the way, I should probably mention that uh, apparently the rules of a Genie of the Ring are different than the rules of a Genie of the Lamp. You know, a Genie from the Lamp can grant you three wishes, Apparently, a genie of a ring can grant an unlimited number of wishes, though the power is relatively limited. Shara can only grant simple wishes, which is why Sonic can't just wish for the Eraser Jin to be defeated or wish for the arrow to be removed. Shara just can't do that. One other thing that's worth mentioning is that as they collect more of the Seven World Rings, Sonic notices that every time he picks one up, he feels a great surge of strong emotion, and each ring is tied to a different one of these emotions. For example, the red ring feels like it's filled with anger, whereas the white ring feels like it's filled with desire, and Sonic goes on about how that could mean many different things. Desire could be aspirations, but it could also be ambition and temptation. So depending on how these rings are used, they can kind of be interpreted in positive or negative ways. Now don't that sound familiar to things we've heard before in Sonic? Yeah, obviously, story-wise, the Seven World Rings here are kind of just our stand-ins for the Seven Chaos Emeralds, but again, I like that we're not just using the Chaos Emeralds. I like that we do have at least some unique, different MacGuffins here. Although another thing about the Seven World Rings is that we have our magical multicolored rings that are like the focal MacGuffins of the story. It's almost as if they forgot that they already did that in Knuckles Chaotix with the Chaos Rings in that game, because these are basically the exact same thing. These have more substance to them, as this game actually has more of a real story, 
But still, it's kind of weird to just be doing rings again as like our singular big MacGuffin of a Sonic story when we've already done that before. You'd think that they would do something a little bit different. Maybe something that was actually like somehow connected to the theming of the game with the Arabian Nights, because... Really, this whole Sonic and the Secret Rings thing and these Seven World Rings, this has absolutely nothing to do with the Arabian Nights at all, which is a little bit strange, but I guess whatever. While collecting another one of the Seven World Rings, then Shara hands Sonic this strange object and she says to hold on to it, and that if all else fails, this will be their last resort as a way to defeat the Eraser Jin. Apparently, whatever it is, Shara can't use it, but uh, I guess Sonic can, so I wonder if that's gonna come up later in the story. Who can say? Anyway, getting close to the end of their journey, Sonic and Shara hear from King Solomon, who is not represented by a Sonic character because he's a weird skeleton guy. They learn from him that the Eraser Jin does have one big weakness, which is that he is in reality a genie of the lamp, and so if you can find his lamp, you can use that to defeat the Jin. And at this point, Sonic and Shara have collected almost all of the Seven World Rings, and so all that's left really is to go confront the Eraser Jin. But before we go on to that, one last thing I want to say is that while I have skipped over a lot of the stuff that happens throughout the course of the game because it's not too plot relevant, similar to Sonic Rush Adventure, there is a lot of good character stuff happens while you play through Sonic and the Seeker Rings. Sonic and Shara are constantly talking to each other and getting to know each other more, getting closer. You know, you get a little bit of fun. Like, Shara's not a particularly, like, super likable character, but I do think they do a good job of slowly building their relationship over the course of the game well enough where she's kind of likable to a degree. Anyway, as Sonic and Shara arrive at the Eraser Jin's palace, then Sonic is starting to feel that arrow really draining him of his energy as he's starting to run out of time. And Shara is getting all upset by this of how she dragged Sonic into this problem that's not really his and now he's suffering for it. But Sonic's like, hey, don't worry about it, I'm fine, remember our promise, I don't want you to be sad, you're supposed to be smiling. To which Shara responds that she remembers the promise they made, and you know, it kind of implies that she's going to do her best to try to keep it. And then the two go on to assault the Eraser Jin's palace, and while going through their palace, they find the last of the Seven World Rings. And after getting it, Sonic decides to ask Shara something that he's a bit curious about, what is her relationship with the Eraser Jin? She seems to know him somehow, and Sonic is curious what that is. Earlier, when King Solomon mentioned that you could seal the Eraser Jin away in his lamp if you managed to find it, Shara was kind of looking a little bit bothered by that, and Sonic has picked up on all these reactions that Shara has had over the course of the story whenever the Eraser Jin comes up. And once again, Shara is feeling uncomfortable being asked this, and Sonic is like, okay, if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. But uh, what Shara does explain is the origin of the Eraser Jin, because as it turns out, he is actually the genie from the story of Aladdin. Apparently, long, long ago, the Eraser Jin was punished for his evil deeds by being forced into the lamp, and he would only be freed after he granted the wishes of 1,000 people. And once he had done so and was finally freed from his lamp, then his hatred for the world and humanity had grown far stronger than ever before. And so now, as retaliation against the entire world that punished him, he wants to destroy the entire thing. So there you go, he's got some motivation there. I like that he actually has a backstory that kind of logically explains what's going on here. He's not just like, I'm bad because I'm bad. I mean, yeah, he is kind of just bad, but you know, being sealed away in a lamp for an extremely long period of time, I could definitely see that pissing someone off and making him want to do everything he's doing in this game. So hey, you know, I'll take it. That's pretty okay by me. And lastly, Shara talks about how the Eraser Jin sees her as nothing more than a genie of the ring and how she wants to stop him from doing what he's doing and return the Arabian Nights to the way it was before. That's what she really wants. And now, Sonic and Shara finally do find the Eraser Jin in his palace for the final showdown. Sonic and the Jin have a little bit of back and forth of, Oh, did you bring me the Seven World Rings? And Sonic's like, eh, I don't know, guess you're gonna have to find out. 
And then the Jin's all, ah, oh, fine, I will find out by cutting you to pieces. And then they fight, and Sonic manages to defeat the Eraser Jin, who then retreats behind this door. And this door can only be opened with the power of the Seven World Rings. And so Sonic and Shara use them to open the door and confront the Jin once and for all, and then he's like, ah, so you do have the Seven World Rings. Fantastic job, Shara, now give the Seven World Rings to me. And surprisingly, Shara is actually doing it. And Sonic is like, whoa, Shara, what are you doing? Are you crazy? What's going on here? But then Shara explains. Despite Sonic's efforts to stop her, Shara did still manage to give the Eraser Jin the Seven World Rings, where he then kind of explains that uh, the reason that they have emotions tied to them is because they are the seven different emotions that are used to create the stories of the Arabian Nights, which is kind of a cool idea, acknowledging that this is a world inside of a story. And of course, stories are the emotions and thoughts and feelings of the writer manifested into a world. So I think that's a cool idea that the Seven World Rings kind of are the very essence of the fiction of the Arabian Nights. But of course, as the prophecy states, in order to properly use the Seven World Rings, then a sacrifice is needed. And, of course, that sacrifice is going to be Sonic, but... Shut up! Sonic... Sorry. I... I understood. I いいんだ。そんなことは。運命変わったかな。約束果たせたかな。シャーラ。メレだ。死ぬな。元に戻るんだ。ごめんなさい。ご主人様。その命令は。We'll talk about all this with Shara in a second, but first, I don't really understand what happens at this point a little bit. So all the Seven World Rings fly into the Eraser Jin and transform him into some giant Cthulhu monster thing because we need to have a giant monster at the end of a Sonic game to be the final boss. And I get that, that's fine, that was triggered by the Seven World Rings power finally being realized and transforming the Jin into a being that can totally control their power. Okay, I get that part, but then, for like, no reason, the Seven World Rings shoot out of the Eraser Jin's back, and then a couple of them fly into Sonic, and then transform him into another form. Why did that happen? I don't know, it just seemed kind of random, but, uh, whatever. So now Sonic is fueled by the World Rings of Rage, Hatred, and Sadness, and using that power in this new form of Dark Spine Sonic, he confronts the Eraser Jin in his new weird form. Anyway, while these two uh, duke it out, why don't we talk a little bit about Shara and the Eraser Jin? Because if you haven't picked it up by this point, the whole deal with Sonic and the Secret Rings is that the story is a metaphor for an abusive relationship. Shara and the Eraser Jin were once together, but the Eraser Jin is obviously a giant fucking monstrous asshole and was an abusive partner to her. And we see that kind of thing earlier in the story when the Jin is asking Shara if she got the World Rings for him, and she's like, what? I'm not gonna do that for you. And he's like, oh, really? You're not? And then she's kind of uncomfortable by him. And then he talks about giving her punishment for resisting him. Shara talks about how she is powerless to do anything against the Eraser Jin's magic like, they've clearly been teasing this thing throughout the entirety of the story. But also, this is a kid's game, and so they kind of try to make it very subtle and kind of hidden a little bit, so you kind of have to really look at things and pay attention to notice that. Which I think makes sense, because, like, an abusive relationship and someone still wanting to be in that relationship, despite the fact that they're getting abused, like, 
Those are concepts that are going to fly right over a kid's head, and so kind of burying them a little bit subtly on the undertones of the story I think is a smart move. I certainly didn't pick up on that at all when I played this game as a kid. That went right over my head, but now I see it and I really appreciate that a kid's cartoony adventure platformer video game is willing to touch such a real and dark topic like this. And of course, it being Sonic, it touches on it in such a positive way. We see that despite the fact that Shara does consciously know that the Eraser Jin is horrible and thinks nothing of her, still at the end of the day, she does feel that attachment to him and she does still try to serve him at the very end because she wants to be together with him despite the fact that he hurts her. You know, she's been in this horrible cycle of emotional manipulation by the Jin for so long that she doesn't know how to break out of that. And it's Sonic that helps her start to see that and makes her realize that what she's doing is hurting herself. That's why Shara was so upset and unsure of her ability to keep that promise with Sonic, because she knew this would happen. She knew that her relationship with the Jin would cause her sadness once again. And she also feels guilty for extending her problems onto Sonic. He's the one that's been forced to collect the world rings with the arrow in him. He's the one that was to become the sacrifice, and Shara wanted to make that right. So she sacrifices herself in order to save Sonic. And even after her death, we see that the Eraser Jin really does not give a fuck about her. This is the guy that she cares about that she has been in this relationship with. This whole relationship with the Jin has not only ruined, but it has also taken Shara's life. However, of course, this is a Sonic the Hedgehog game, and so we can't end with such a uh, depressing conclusion as that. Sonic needs to do his thing. Sonic needs to bring good to Shara and make everything right. And we get to see that all in the final cutscene, which I'm just going to let play because it's the best cutscene in the game and it's pretty fucking badass and awesome. このままじゃ終わらん。何とでも蘇ってやる。私に死はない。消えることのない存在なのだ。何それは。へへ。これ預かっていて。元に戻るんだ。<笑><笑> <何それは>。<笑> つめ。消えてしまったこの世界の話、アラビアンナイトを全て元に戻すんだ。な。3つ目、イレーザー人。お前はランプの生徒として昔通りランプの中で過ごせ。シャラ、いるんだろう。止めてくれ。こいつを止めてくれ。また二人でやり直そう。嘘じゃない。嘘じゃないんだ。私が世界を滑るもののはず。それがこんな薄汚いネズミに。なぜだ。俺は薄汚いネズミなんかじゃない。ちょっとすごいハレネズミなんだよ。シャラ、俺の願いを聞いてくれるか。ハンカチを山ほど出してくれ。
海ができるまで泣いていいぞハンカチは山のようにあるからな I really, really love that scene. That scene is probably honestly like one of the best scenes in like the whole Sonic series. Everything comes together so well. We have the payoff of the fact that the Eraser Jin is a genie of the lamp and the thing that Shara gave to Sonic, it turns out that was his lamp. And with the Eraser Jin being a genie and this being Sonic and the Secret Rings themed all around genies and stuff like that, it's so awesome that the way Sonic defeats the bad guy is by using his three genie wishes. That's just so fucking cool. We get to see in his final moments the Eraser Jin's true colors when he's groveling pathetically, where we get to see that、uh, without Shara, without someone to abuse, without someone to take advantage of and put down, then he's nothing. We get a very nice payoff to the Eraser Jin constantly calling Sonic a rat and him not appreciating that and putting the Jin in his place. And we even get a payoff to the handkerchief bit from the beginning of the game. Everything ties together here in this final cutscene so extremely well. It is very, very well done. And of course, the ending with Shara here is that after it's all been said and done and she's realized how harmful the Eraser Jin has been to her life, she is overcome with emotional turmoil over the fact that the Eraser Jin has hurt her so much, but also that she has to say goodbye to this person that is harmful to her, but at the same time, she does still care about him. She needs to put this person behind her and move on with her life, and that's just a difficult, painful thing to do. And Sonic is there to be a shoulder for her to cry on. It's just so wonderful tackling this, again, very dark and very mature theme that you really do not see in children's media ever. But Sonic and the Seeker Rings is willing to tackle it, and it does it pretty tastefully and very well in a way that is perfectly appropriate for Sonic. The story of Sonic and the Seeker Rings is actually just straight up good. No asterisk, no good for a Sonic story, no good for a video game story. It's just a good story. It has a theme, it effectively conveys it, it has fun characters, fun interactions along the way. You know, as I said, while there's not a whole lot of plot progression throughout most. To the story, you do get lots of fun character moments that makes this feel like a fun adventure that Sonic and Shara are going on together. And then it all comes together wonderfully with this ending, with really no major issues here. You may find it a little bit strange, the whole Dark Spine Sonic thing, the fact that Sonic is being fueled by the power of rage, hatred, and sadness. You know, because Sonic is like the paragon of good. He brings positive change to everyone around him, so why is he being fueled by such negative emotions? Like, yeah, he used the rings, but like, narratively, why did they choose to do that? It seems a little bit off for Sonic. But you gotta remember what Sonic said earlier in the story that these emotions can be used for either good or bad. It's not these negative emotions inherently that are bad, it's when you allow these negative emotions to manifest in bad ways. In Sonic Adventure 1, Chaos was giving in to hatred and anger and sadness in the wrong way, just wallowing in the pain and using everyone and everything as an outlet, hurting them all. Whereas Sonic, he is taking these emotions, these negative emotions that are painful, and he is using them to defeat the Eraser Jin. In the right circumstances, anger and sadness, these can be the emotions that one needs to confront something or someone that is hurting them. When these emotions are allowed to come out, then that is when someone can say, enough is enough. At least, that's how I interpreted it. That's pretty consistent with how the Sonic series is usually written with these kinds of things. I mean, even the story of Sonic Shuffle kind of deals with this whole idea of negative emotions are kind of good in a certain way. They're necessary and important, and you shouldn't just ignore them or try to hide them away. And so, in this situation, the anger and sadness that is fueling Sonic, that is Shara's anger and sadness that she feels due to everything the Jin has done to her. And thus, Sonic fighting the Jin here is Shara fighting back against the Jin. It's great! I love it! It's fantastic! It's exactly the kind of story I want to see out of Sonic. And kind of the biggest problem with it is that it's attached to a game that is not exactly the best. 
And uh, we do get one final little scene where we get a narration from Shara explaining that after their adventure, Sonic went on many adventures through the Arabian Nights until he eventually managed to make his way back home. No explicit explanation of how he did that, but whatever, who cares? The point is that after all was said and done, Sonic and Shara were able to keep their promise. Sonic was able to come into this story and change it for the better. Thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, I'll see you next time.